SEP Fanfic Readings presents My True Love Gave to Me by Notebook and Ink Chapter 2 Nifflers in Gold December 2000 Draco browsed the aisles of a muggle music shop. He'd become quite fond of the stuff ever since his therapist made the suggestion that music could possibly help him with his trauma. And other than contemporary, wizard music left much to be desired for him. So once a month, after his appointment, he ventured into Muggle London to get something new. Then he might go to a cafe or a park or just wander around and muggle watch for a while. He liked this particular shop because they had a huge selection, and because of this they sorted their wares by genre and decade, instead of just alphabetically like a lot tended to do. For the last few months he was working his way through the 80s, but found that he didn't like them as much as what the 70s had to offer. He had just picked up an album titled Songs from the Big Chair when the bell on the door chimed plainly. Draco tried as hard as he could to continue to read the song list on the back of the album and not direct his attention to whomever had just walked in. The hypervigilance was one of the last few side effects he carried, but it seemed to be the hardest for him to break, probably because it stemmed from farther into his childhood and was not just a product of the war, or so his therapist had seemed fit to inform him. He doubled his focus on the album and tried to decide if it seemed like something he wanted to take home when his ears picked up a familiar voice, though it seemed less swatty than it used to be. He looked up, and there she was at the front of the checkout. Granger. She wore her muggle jeans and a large maroon turtleneck jumper under a navy blue peacoat, and her hair was somewhat tamed under a knit hat. She was asking the shop clerk where she might find something, and the goateed man pointed her in the direction she needed to go. Granger nodded with a bright smile, and Draco let out a sigh of relief as she headed in the other direction of the store. It wasn't that he wanted to outright avoid her. He just didn't know what he would say to her. About halfway through eighth year at Hogwarts, he had finally gathered up enough courage to apologize for everything that had happened between them, including what transpired when she was brought to his home. But he never knew if she truly accepted that apology, because she just stared at him the whole time, and then walked off in silence. Maybe it had been too soon? Or maybe she would never forgive him, for any of it. Not that he deserved it, anyway. He'd been a right arsehole for most of their lives. Still, he'd wanted her to accept his apology. He'd wanted to show her that he could change, but he wouldn't be forced it on her. Draco picked a few more albums from the bin in front of him, and went over to the listening area to pop one in and put on the headphones. He'd made it through half of the big chair songs when he decided it was not for him. Then suddenly something pinched the back of his bicep. Ow! He gritted and quickly took off the massive headphones before he turned around to face his assailant. Sorry, Granger apologized. Her face was laced with genuine shock at the sight of him. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. It really is you. Shouldn't you be pinching yourself then, Granger? Draco asked, his tone holding more sarcasm than malice. He rubbed his arm over his shirt sleeve with the palm of his hand to dull the sting. For someone so small, she had surprisingly strong fingers. At some point during her browsing, she'd taken her coat and hat off, she now carried them over her arm, and in that same hand was a little plastic bag with a few CDs. She must have spotted him on her way out. Now that she stood before him, Draco could see how she'd grown into a woman's body. How she had more curves, even under her bulky sweater. And her face had thinned out to reveal even more bone structure. He wasn't embarrassed to admit that she was more than a little beautiful. But as he scanned her, he noticed that something he'd assumed would be there, in fact, was missing. "'Again, I'm sorry,' she replied, and seemed sincere. "'What are you doing here?' "'Hunting for pygmy puffs,' he answered. "'What else does one do in a music shop?' "'But this is Muggle London.' "'Oh, really? I'd better get to hexing, then.' His eyes sparked playfully. Granger rolled her own and started to walk away, but he reached out and lightly grabbed her on her empty arm. "'Uh, wait,' he said quickly, as he turned her back around. "'I'm sorry.' Sarcasm is a hard habit to break. Especially if one makes it a large part of their personality, she shot back. Draco felt contrite. Yes, I know this is Muggle London. No, I don't run around hexing them. I like coming here. I do it once a month, he confessed. It was not something many people knew about. He looked down and noticed he was still holding onto her arm, so he finally let go. You like hanging around muggles? Her brow shot up and she shifted her belongings in her arms. "'They're interesting people who do interesting things,' he shrugged. "'And this is usually only the first stop on the tour.' "'Where else do you go?' 
There's a cafe a few blocks over. Some good drama there. It's practically a playhouse. Or there's the park. Wow, Granger said incredulously, then smiled. Draco Malfoy, muggle lover. Never in my lifetime would I have thought I'd see it. Draco ran a hand through his hair, then rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly. He couldn't help the smile that pulled at the edge of his lips in response to hers. It was like it was contagious. What brings you in here? Oh, she said and looked down at her bag. Christmas shopping. My dad is a bit music guy. Jazz, mostly. Never got into the stuff, he replied, and rocked on his heels. She laughed lightly. No, I never did either. He always says I'm missing out. Draco was about to ask how her parents were. He'd heard what she'd done during the start of the war to keep them out of harm's way, and since she'd brought up her father, it seemed the polite thing to do if this conversation was to continue forward. How? Well, I better get going, she cut him off. I've still got a bit more shopping to do. Uh, yeah. Well, it was nice to see you, Granger. He'd started, but by the time he'd finished, she'd walked out of earshot, then out the front doors. Draco just stood there like a statue, and watched her go by the window until she was out of sight. A few days later, Draco sat in an emerald suede wing-back chair alone in his study. It was after dinner, so he'd had a book open on his lap, and a glass of fire whiskey on the oak side table. Suddenly, his fireplace roared to life, and Thea walked out of the green flames, before they settled back to their regular orangey glow. "'Hey, hey, bachelor boy!' the jovial wizard called out as he strolled into the room. "'Hello, Theo,' Draco replied with as much disinterest as he could muster, not even bothering to look up from his book. He sounded much too happy, and that meant that there was a scheme to be plotted, and Draco wanted nothing to do with it. The brown-haired wizard made his way to the bar cart. He inspected the bottles, picked the most expensive, and then poured himself a glass. "'You convinced your mum to give you a free year, and what have you done with it? Fuck all!' he said before downing the amber liquid and immediately pouring another. While Theo was the type who desired luxury, he wasn't the type to appreciate it, probably why he went through partners like Parchment. "'Please, help yourself to a drink.' Draco rolled his eyes at his friend, who was now moving to plop down on the leather sofa. "'Your time is almost up. What are you doing cooped up in here? We need to get you out. Get you laid,' Theo smirked. "'Blaze and I are going out tonight. You should join us.' Draco closed his book with a snap and set it on the side table. Clearly, Theo was here to stay for a while, perhaps on instructions to pester him until he complied. He picked up his own glass and took a drink to help him through however long this was going to take. "'Come on. Pansy's back in town, and Tracy said Daphne is too, though we won't see her until tomorrow. But for the most part, it'll be like old times,' Theo continued. "'Trying to tempt me out with Pansy is not the winning move you think it is,' he replied drolly. If Pansy was involved in the night's plans, then Theo was definitely under orders to pester him until he caved. Draco swirled the liquid in his glass and considered. It wouldn't kill him to go out with his friends, but it's not like he had anything better lined up for the evening. Just a simple night in with a book and some whiskey, and he'd had nights like that for most of the year. Plus, even though he'd hated to admit it, Theo was right. His time to spend his days and nights in any way he wanted was up. After deliberation, he acquiesced. Fine. I'll go with you on two conditions. All right, Theo perked up. One, Draco started, pointing an accusatory finger at his friend. You find your own way home. I'm not letting you sloppy side along with me just to wake up in the morning and find you passed out naked in my bathtub. Again. Theo held up his hands in surrender. That was one time. Okay, two times. What's the second? You tell me what you know about Granger. Granger? The other wizard dropped his hands to his lap as his brow quirked up. Of all people, why do you want to know about Granger? Draco shrugged nonchalantly, then took the final swig of his glass. I ran into her the other day in Muggle London, and I was surprised to see she didn't wear a ring. You remember how I told you last year when I caught Weasley trying to buy one for her? Yeah, I heard that all kind of blew up in his face. Apparently, she said no straight off, and they broke up pretty harshly a few weeks later. Then she quit her job at the Ministry in the Creature Department and now works for Scamander Foundation. Draco was more than a little dumbfounded. He figured Granger and Weasley would get married for sure, even though he never understood why they were together in the first place. She was brilliant, and he was a half-wit. How do you know all that? It was much more information than he had been expecting Theo to have. I gave generously to the Foundation this year. You did too, but I'm not surprised you didn't know that, seeing as you didn't go to the gala they gave— Talk to her there. 
Get her a little boozy, and she could be quite the chatterbox. Draco swirled the signet ring on his finger. He remembered his mother mentioning something about a charity gala last spring, but he declined to attend. Now he wished he had gone. Anyway, I guess old Newt's grandson is more of a pencil pusher, so they asked her to take his place in the field. She spends most of the year away from England, out cataloguing and rehabilitating creatures. You have the gift of true gossip, my friend, and know everything there is to know about everyone. It's a wonder Skeeter hasn't recruited you yet. She wishes she had my skills. Theo puffed his chest with pride and laughed. Draco rolled his eyes, then stood from his chair. All right, then. You held up your end. Let's go. When he shifted, a stream of light coming into the room through the slit and the thick green curtains fell across Draco's face, which scrunched up at the bright contact. He flexed his long fingers and pushed his chest off the mattress, the muscles of his forearms going taut against his skin. The bedsheet only barely covered his bare arse. He turned his head to look at the alarm clock in his nightstand. It was already half-past noon. With a groan, he opened his arms out wide and fell back into the mattress with a small bounce. Tippy, he called, barely a whisper. Yes, Master Draco. The house elf appeared at his bedside with a small snap. She had been his elf since he was a child. Is there any hangover potion in my bathroom cabinet? He asked. His voice was raspy. Yes, indeed. Would you like me to fetch it for you? She asked. No, that's okay, Tippy. I'll get it. I don't suppose there's any breakfast left. No, but lunch will be served in fifteen minutes. Should I tell your mother you'll be down? She's been busy with the event planners, but I'm sure she will take time for you. Sure, Tippy. Thanks. With another snap of her fingers, she was gone, and Draco attempted to get out of the bed with some semblance of grace. He made his way onto the ensuite and glanced into the tub as he passed by it. Thankfully, it was empty this time. He made his way over to the sink and leaned his bare arms against the cold porcelain. He turned on the cold tap, cupped some water in his hands, and leaned his face down into it for a few seconds before pushing it up and through his blonde locks. Draco looked up and into the mirror. His eyes were bloodshot and rimmed with dark circles. His mouth was dry and tasted like cigarettes. His hair was flopping in every direction, but at least it was back to its usual length. He was glad that he'd gotten it cut. The longer it got, the more he looked like his father, and that was something he wouldn't let happen on purpose. He trudged to the cabinet to retrieve the much-needed potion, and threw it back before he did the bare minimum to get ready before heading downstairs. He would just have to come back up to scrub for the party in a few hours anyway. "'Ah, there you are. I was beginning to worry you might sleep through the party.' Narcissa fixed him with those stern eyes as he entered the room where they ate their breakfast and lunch. It was less formal than the dining room. The table was smaller and more intimate, and the place settings were more plain, yet still decorated for the holiday season. "'I know where I'm needed,' he replied and slipped down in his chair. "'I do hope you enjoyed the evening with your friends.' She only said this because she knew that their deal had now run its course. Tomorrow morning she expected him to take his place as head of the Malfoy family, and in her mind that did not include wild nights out in clubs with his friends. It was managing investments, going to charity galas— schmoozing with other wealthy families, and sticking his nose into politics. Not to mention marrying well, and giving the world another male Malfoy heir. Mm-hmm, was his only response before he began his lunch. It was not worth getting into an argument at this point. He told her he'd do his duty with no complaints, and he intended on sticking to his word. As ravenous as he was, decorum still won out as long as Narcissa Malfoy was in the room. So lunch proceeded slowly— and, as usual, she finally spoke again when he was finished. "'What do you think of the house?' "'It looks wonderful, Mother. You really went all out,' he replied dryly after wiping his mouth with his napkin. "'Well, this is our first party after a lengthy break. I wanted to make it unforgettable.' "'I'm sure it will be.' Her blue eyes fixed on his grey ones. "'I was hoping you would take more of an interest. This party is, after all, so you can make a name for yourself.' Make a name for yourself sounded an awful lot like fix all our problems to Draco, but after everything his mother had been through during the war, he would do what he could to make her happy, even if it meant putting on a version of the character that was the perfect Malfoy heir. Draco had been used to his mother decorating the entire house for Christmas. She'd been doing it ever since he could remember, but she had tripled her efforts for this returning Christmas party. 
Every flue fireplace in the foyer was roaring with birch logs and trimmed with garland and bows, while thick cream-colored candles flickered on their mantles. Just ahead, in the center of the curved stone staircase, whose railings were also wrapped in garland, stood a ten-foot Fraser fir tree tastefully packed with white and gold ornaments and glittering gold starburst tree topper. all of this being backdropped by the floor-to-ceiling multi-paned windows that were now frosted over in the corners. In the ballroom, the floor had been freshly waxed and shined to perfection. Fabric and light swagged high on the walls, and a stage had been erected at the north end where a string quartet had set up their instruments. Every window held onto a large wreath, ringed with twinkling lights and an oversized cream-colored bow. Round tables, draped in white linens with gold chairs and hosting vases of white poinsettias, were scattered around the south end. There, in the wall, was another enormous fireplace done up the same as the others in the foyer, only its mantle was entirely filled with candles, and the ceiling had been enchanted to drop a light snow of thick, pillowy snowflakes that dissipated halfway to the floor. Even with all the grandeur, the evening was just a lot of waiting for Draco. After lunch he'd gone back upstairs, showered and changed into his fitted tux and tailcoat. Then he waited around in his study with a glass of fire whiskey until it was time to go down. Then he waited for his mother at the top of the grand staircase so they could make their grand entrance into the ballroom. Then he waited by her side on the stage while she made a speech about how lucky they all were to be able to get together with old friends and new acquaintances. Then he waited around for dinner to be served, then waited some more between each course. By the time the quartet started playing more lively music after the meal, Draco wanted nothing more than to slip away. But it was customary for the host to dance first. Then his mother felt the need to introduce him to multiple old windbags who he had to wait for to stop talking. After a few hours had managed to stretch into eternity, Draco finally managed to slip away to his study. He was loosening his bow tie as he entered and saw Pansy, Daphne, Theo, and Blaze sitting around multiple stolen bottles of champagne, a few already empty. "'What are you guys doing in here?' he asked curiously. "'Don't get me wrong, Draco. Your mother throws a beautiful party. But over half the people down there could be my grandparents. Some of them are my grandparents,' Pansy explained." "'Yeah, what's with the geriatric family reunion?' Theo chimed in. Draco knew this was Theo's way of mocking the Sacred Twenty-Eight and their pure-blood intermarrying beliefs. Draco raised his hands in surrender. "'I told you already. I didn't have anything to do with the guest list.' Blaze, ever the voice of reason, came calmly to Narcissa's defense. "'She wants to ensure Draco has the proper connections to forge a future.' Unfortunately, she's a little misguided as to how far into the future those downstairs will be able to take him. You got that right. Most of them will be in the ground come spring, Pansy cried. We get it, Pans. They're old, Daphne rolled her eyes. Draco sat down next to Daphne on the sofa and gave her a sidelong hug. Of his friends, he preferred her the most. Pansy was too hot-tempered, while Blaze was utterly aloof, and Theo was some sort of symbiotic parasite he couldn't get rid of. Daphne was the best bits of all of them. She was pretty even-tempered, but not afraid to speak her mind. She liked to go out and have fun, but also didn't mind a night in. It was honestly too bad she'd already found the love of her life and moved to the continent. "'It's good to see you, Darth. How's Roger?' Draco asked. Roger Davies was a few years ahead of them in school, and Draco had never liked him much. Though he was good on a Quidditch field, that seemed to be his only redeeming quality— and to him Roger had always seemed a bit of a player with no real tact. These would be things he could not put aside if it wasn't for Daphne. For her, he would try to like the git. "'Roger is good. He likes his new job, and we're settling into life pretty easily,' she smiled. "'Glad to hear it,' he smiled back, and pulled her in to kiss the top of her head, then kept her close. It really had been too long since he'd seen her. "'Get a room,' Theo rolled his eyes. "'And why shouldn't I show her affection?' Draco scowled at him. She's the only one of you lot I actually like. That hurts me, Draco. Really hurts me. Right here. Theo thumped his chest with his fist. You'll get over it by raiding my bar, I'm sure of it, he smirked. If I was a betting man, I'd put money on that, he replied with a wicked grin on his face. Can we please get back to things that actually matter? Pansy interrupted. Draco, you'll have to do something about next year's party— there simply cannot be another like this. I won't allow it. Blaze reached into the array of bottles and pulled one out to uncork. What do you want me to do, Pens? 
he answered. "'For starters, tell your mother you'll be handling the party planning from now on,' she straightened up in her seat, "'and then hire me to do it all.' "'Or me,' Theo piped up. "'The whole point of the party is to make Draco seem like a sure thing, Theo.' Blaze poured himself a glass, not to further the notion that he is a hooligan. Like you. Theo slumped in his chair to pout. Pansy, I'm not going to tell my mother she can no longer be part of the planning, especially when she gets such joy out of doing it. I will only make it a priority to have more say, but until she no longer wants to do it, it is her brainchild. Pansy sat back in her chair and crossed her arms to see that this rejection. Daphne used her own knee to bump his then twitched her head in the other girl's direction. She knew if Pansy didn't get her way, she would just make it the rest of the night miserable for the lot of them. Salazar helped him for what he was about to say. But, he sighed, should that day ever come, you are more than welcome to help me carry on the tradition. Pansy beamed, and Draco snagged Daphne's glass of champagne. What had he just gotten himself into?'